Hi, welcome to Prospero's On Demand session for Microsoft Ignite 2021. I am Keith Lippman, the CEO of Prosperware. I will be discussing how your project-based or relationship-based organization can gain adoption, governance of Office 365, including OneDrive, Teams, and SharePoint Online. So what is a project-based organization? Examples of project-centric organizations are law, accounting, consulting, professional services, banking, and finance. All right. How are they? They're all the same. What makes them different is just simply what they call their projects. So law calls it a matter. Accounting calls it an engagement. Consulting typically calls it a project. Doesn't really matter. Also, you find you know the same thing of project-centric organizations in different departments. So IT, finance, and other things are always doing projects, and other different groups are doing projects across the year. What makes them all similar? And what would make it a specific need for project-centric organizations is the fact that they deal in thousands to tens of thousands of projects per year or relationships, right? So typically, if you look at a large law firm, they may generate 10,000 plus uh, matters per, per month and hundreds of thousands of matters per year in some cases, and it could be less. And they have thousands and tens of thousands of relationships. The same thing applies to an accounting firm and many consulting firms. This is all a question of scale, but it's how you deal with it and make sure that people really uh, understand those requirements of what we're talking about today. All right, why is adoption and governance critical? Well, I think the biggest thing I can talk about is two really fundamental ideas. Cybersecurity, regulatory compliance, right? Those are the two issues. So if you think about it with cybersecurity, we have seen in the news today massive stories of huge breaches affecting large companies, you know, where the Fortune 500 has been hit and there's been a lot of impact to a lot of different companies and governments. And what, what the end result of that is, I hope at this point, everybody basically comes in and goes, it's not if I will be breached, it's when I will be breached. And the challenge is when the breach happens, on average, the bad guys are in your network for upwards to six months to a year, and all sorts of damage can be done in the interim. You don't know what they've taken, you don't know what they've deleted, and so the question is, is how are you gonna protect yourself? Similarly, on the regulatory side, we have increasing pressure around protecting people's privacy from different governmental organizations. This is critical. The challenge, of course, is, you know, people have been talking about all of this stuff for years and years. Now there's an extreme pressure to get it done. So let's, let's take a moment and talk about what we call the chaos problem. Human beings, when they come to save and organize information on their desktop, in their computer, or for work, always do what is best for them. And what typically they do is they take a document, they create a folder for the project, they name it something else, and they may call it applesauce, even though the project is something completely different because they understand what that means, and they will store content in there. As a result, when someone else comes and looks at it, they'll have no understanding of what the context of that folder is, what the purpose of that, except for the fact that there's some documents in there that may have some description, that may have some information. Well, if I'm a risk management professional or even I'm another user, how do I know what that folder is supposed to be used for and what should I do about that data? And that becomes a really, really big problem from both an adoption perspective and a risk problem. So the risk management person does not really understand whether this is data we should keep or get rid of. So what do they need to do? Well, they call the person going, well, we see you have a folder called applesauce. Well, what should we do with it? Is it a current project? Do we still need the data? Can we get rid of it? Um, who should be secured to? What are the concerns we should have? Each one of those things is gonna take a long time and do you really wanna answer the phone from the risk management person who says, oh, I need to do that? Now, first problem we've gotta solve is how do we get adoption around putting it in a shared structure that is collaborative, that everybody understands the context of the data so that we, the risk management people know what's going on and the end users that you're working with and you're collaborating on this project also understand. I know what you're thinking right now. Artificial intelligence and natural language processing is not gonna be the solution to this problem. The challenge for artificial intelligence is it's really good at grouping data into nice piles, but it needs to have very, very similar groups of data that, to make those piles. The challenge is on project data, many times, Project A and Project B and Project C all contain very, very similar data and maybe only separated by information that is 
what we call an entity, right? A person, a place, and a thing. So until you start putting lots of data together and understand that this project and this collection of projects is all about this set of people, places, and things, would you have ability to really apply AI? So really, AI could solve the problem of maybe trying to go back in time if you have really good metadata. So let's, let's talk about this from the concept of metadata, right? You know, how do you use rich metadata? Well, metadata in a project-centric organization is most organizations, law firms, accounting firms that, um, who, have, who are revenue-driven have a project ID, and large organizations who do projects also usually have a project portfolio management system that has an ID. Um, that metadata is, okay, we've got a title, we got a name of what it is, so we can use that ID as a, almost a primary key with whatever is the system of record for creating it. it could be CRM, ERP, um, a practice management system, an e-billing system, whatever that is. But a project also has more metadata than just its name. It'll have a start date and an end date, which will be critical for trying to drive disposition and other things. It may have, what is, if, I'm, if it's revenue driven, what's the service delivery? So what am I doing? Is it a labor dispute or an employment dispute? Is it, in, is it a patent? Is it a um, audit? What is the type of project it is and what are we delivering? It'll also have, you know, that'll give you some understanding of how long it'll take long way. And then generally associated with that project is going to be people, places, and things, right? So in others, I call them players, the players and the parties, right? Who are, who are you working with? Who's participating? You know, who's named? Or who are, who's on the other side of who you're working with? So all of that metadata could be used to then drive AI and be really successful for the rest teams, but it's not going to be a catch-all because you're driving into chaos and making kind of better chaos buckets, but it's not going to solve the real core problem. Let's talk about our core philosophy for how do we approach this problem of getting adoption and governance of a collaboration system, particularly Office 365. Well, we have basically five concepts, right? One, we need to have an ability to provision, classify, protect, move, and minimize. What do I mean by provision? Provision means from your system that currently tracks your projects, which could be the ERP, the e-billing, practice management, time and billing, we can automatically generate a team, a channel, a folder, so that you now can put the right content immediately as fast as possible. Classify, can we basically make sure that we've got rich metadata around it so we can understand the context of it? So when you go into you know, Teams or you go into a folder, it says, okay, we can see the start date, the end date, all that rich metadata that you collected in, in your source system for projects, protect. Protect is really the idea that if you need this data, we have protected it in multiple ways. So we protect it in the concept of making sure that you always have a copy available, and we protect it to make sure that everybody has the right security. Move is simply the concept that if you need to import data or export data, that we're aware of what we need to do. And finally, minimize is to get, is to finally get rid of it, get rid of the data that you don't need. All right, let's get into classify. This is really, our most important thing, which is getting business context, right? The classification and application of metadata is really core. And, and why we want to do this is because we can answer many, many, many questions from that metadata. We can apply a disposition policy. How long do we need to keep the data? We can provide a logical, answer the logical question, who should have access to it because we know who's working on the project. Who else should, should be involved and who should we be able to email content because we know who's the players and parties. So all of this metadata can give us the context to drive both risk management, but also communicate and collaborate for the people working on it or who are joining it, who are the important players and other key information about it. So think about it this way. If you're trying to get rid of a set of documents, you need to know where the different content stores are for a particular project. So first you need a kind of a directory of where it is and you need to know how that maps into the directory. And then you need to be able to say, okay, we found all those storage locations for, for this particular project. Now we can go get rid of the data. And that's how we basically try to basically protect the data and can drive it to also minimize it. What I want to do is I'm going to turn it over to Tina for a moment. And Tina is basically going to give you a quick demo of kind of in our product, what a directory looked like to give you a little context of what I mean. Here is an example of how a unified project directory could look like. As your organization works across many projects or engagements, it is necessary for admin users to see where all these projects or engagements have been provisioned in. Such capabilities are available in our Prosperoware CAM platform. 
provisioning of workspaces and sites for projects or engagements can be done automatically or on demand. Metadata and security are created on a project-centric basis and are constantly updated as required. You can easily search and filter based on customized metadata fields and see the systems where the project has workspaces in. It also becomes important to have security information at a glance and make modifications to security to ensure consistency and compliance with need-to-know security policies. On top of that, having a unified project directory enables your organization to see the metadata of your collaboration systems, such as Microsoft Teams. It allows you to know exactly where the data is for a project or engagement, which becomes particularly necessary when governance is concerned. So I hope that the idea of the directory is now clear to you. Now let's talk about kind of our next core principle, which is protect, right? Protect. Well, protect is a word. So first, let's talk about in the context of data protection, which is first idea is that, you know, matter what, if we think the hacker is going to be in there for, you know, months and months and months, and they're going to delete data or ransomware data or do something, you need to have a separate copy of your information in some other cloud because that will make sure that even if the hackers delete your content, you have an archived copy of everything that's going on. You also should really seriously contemplate kind of taking a very zero trust approach to how you deal with security around projects. Sometimes that's going to be called need to know. In other words, only the people who need access to the project have access at any particular time. And then how much self-service you provide and how much you allow people to either give access or grant access or control that access may determine on the confidentiality level of, the, of that particular project. Also important to apply data loss prevention principles to all your data. And there's a couple different contexts, right? There's the traditional DLP perspective, which is we want to stop you know, healthcare data from leaving the organization or, or prevent somebody from emailing social security information or some of those very basic DLP ideas. But it's also beyond that, which is also applying kind of some of the principles out of ISO 27001, which says when someone leaves or joins your organization, you want to make sure that they only have access to what they need to. And so when someone leaves, what you want to do is actually go through the process of actually saying, let's remove them from the access control list of every document, workspace, team, channel, SharePoint site, whatever, so that if somebody accidentally turns that account back on, they will not have access to anything. And this is, I think, one of the most core things that many organizations forget to do and can really help protect your data. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Tina, and she's going to give you a little demo of how we do that. As changes in departments, security level, and even documents happen constantly, it becomes necessary for Service Desk to update user access to ensure proper security and governance. Here is an example of how you can manage access and specifically remove user access from access control lists. First of all, Service Desk operators can use the Documents tab to search for documents across supported systems, such as Microsoft Teams. The CAM platform shown here has fully configurable search fields with actions enabled by roles and permissions. For example, Service Desk can easily remove access for a person that changed departments. Doing so manually is time-consuming, prone to error and security risks especially when considering all the documents that person has access to, which could be in thousands. As such, having an automation platform becomes particularly important when DLP and access management are concerned, as security changes to any documents can be done in bulk, minimizing human error and risk. I hope that last example of how we can remove a user from an access control list shows how you can protect your information in case somebody accidentally or intentionally re-enables an account. If the account is re-enabled, they won't have access to any information. It's just an account that's open. The next kind of philosophy we want to talk about is minimize, right? Minimize is basically saying, get rid of the data you don't need. Because if you have a breach or you have a privacy incident or something else, a privacy investigation, you there's no information. No one can get anything. So if you don't have it, you can't be breached. And so how do we do that, right? Well, we need to have a clear definition of when can we dispose of the data? When is it the valuable data, when the value of the data is done? So it could be for a legal reason. So typically tax information in the United States, you need to keep it for seven years. In year eight, you can get rid of it. There are other types of data has longer retention or shorter retention. But the real trick is to say, 
and say to your, you know, your business owners of that project, is it time to get rid of it? Have them validate that we can get rid of it. Identify what is a permanent record. So an example of a permanent record would be a signed contract. Typically they're kept much longer. And so you need to designate and separate those. But anything else that you don't need should be gotten rid of in order to reduce your risk. But all of that starts with clear metadata and a good directory of that information. I hope that you kind of got the idea of what we're trying to do for project-based and relationship-based organizations by basically giving you a call to action around cybersecurity and privacy. Now, if you don't think cybersecurity is now a board level issue, let me tell you about a Delaware Supreme Court opinion called about Bluebell, which is a dairy that makes Blue Bunny ice cream. And in that case, there was a listeria outbreak. The end result of the Delaware Supreme Court held the board of directors are personally liable for risk. So cybersecurity, managing cybersecurity and privacy issues in the organization is a board level issue. We've also seen ongoing and growing privacy fines probably stalled this year due to COVID, but we expect that to kind of regain speed over the next couple of years. I think cybersecurity is a much more present danger for most organizations, especially after what has happened in December of last year. So what do we need to do? Your challenge, you need to get people to adopt the collaboration systems and put data in the right location for the project and relationship so that you can get the important business context of what's going on. This gets even more critical as people are working remote, because of course, it's even more difficult to get people's attention, especially for mismanagement and other folks. And this, if you think about it, Teams as that core strategy of the modern workplace is really a place to really put that focus and make each team, in essence, a project, a matter, an engagement to really facilitate that type of work and collaborative working over time. So I hope you understand that kind of our approach, create the day, you know, in order to get adoption, immediately provision these matter projects, engagements, et cetera, the moment you create them in the system of record and then have that, use that rich metadata to then govern what's gonna happen to the data over time. If you don't provision things and you kind of have a long delay between when a project starts in the structured system and people start working on it and then they get a filing location, you're gonna have a gap of data that's gonna sit alone and is gonna have problems over time. And that, cause it'll never get into that designated location and it'll just become a risky, a risky opportunity. So. What, do we, what is Prospero about? We're here about trying to solve all of these last mile problems. Thank you for watching this on-demand video. Don't forget to visit Prospero's showcase to see what we can do for you and add our exclusive giveaways. Thank you very much.